We're continuing our study today on Christ honoring Christianity. This is a three week series that picks up the threads that John has been using and weaving together and, bro and bringing before us as evidence of our union with Christ. He's speaking about a relationship with Christ and what it looks like. He's speaking in the context of the final hours of his life ministry among his disciples. John tells us that Judas has been dismissed, that Judas has been exposed as the one who would betray Jesus, at least to John, and Jesus dismisses him on his mission of betraying him. And so we're down to 11 disciples. Jesus washes their feet and then teaches them about love and service or love and ministry. So our first message was entitled Christ Honoring Christianity, Love and Service. And in that context, Jesus speaks in terms of our relationship with the Father, our relationship with the Son, and our relationship with one another. He speaks of, in terms of the relationship between the Father and Son and between the Son and the believer, and thus between the Father and the Son and the believers. That relationship is manifested in love and service, love and service to God and love and service to each other. In John chapter 14, we saw that the emphasis there by John was that of faith and obedience. So Christ honoring Christianity not only includes love and service or ministry, but includes faith and obedience. In John 14, there's an emphasis on our relationship with the truth in our daily lives. John introduces the Holy Spirit as part of Jesus' teaching, that Jesus would send another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so our relationship with the Father and the Son and one another comes before us in John 13 in terms of love and service. But in John 14, our relationship with the truth in our daily lives and the ministry of God's Holy Spirit is revealed in terms of faith and obedience. Well, today we'd like to look at the emphasis of John 15, Christ honoring Christianity in regards to hope and fruitfulness, hope and fruitfulness, our relationship with the mission of Christ in this world. It includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the believer. There's hope and fruitfulness before us in John chapter 15, and that has to do with our relationship with the mission of Christ in the world. This is part of the tapestry of Jesus' final instruction. This is part of those threads that are woven together so that Christ beauty, Christ beauty, the beauty of Christ is produced in us so that Jesus is seen in us. This is the glory of transformative Christianity as we are transformed into the image of Christ. Our lives are marked by love and service, by faith and obedience, by hope and fruitfulness. A love that serves God and others. A faith that obeys our master. A hope that manifests itself in fruitfulness. This is the normal Christian life as described by Jesus Christ himself. This is the fruit of life and death and resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the impact of of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives and working in the lives of his disciples. This is the witness of genuine saving grace. Those that have been justified and sanctified are marked, their lives are marked by this love that serves God and others, this faith that obeys our master, this hope that manifests itself in fruitfulness. This shapes our worship. It shapes our walk. It shapes our witness. We have the example of Jesus Christ before us, but we also have the emphasis of Jesus Christ before us. That 
Christianity, discipleship, is really a transference of his very life to his disciples. The extension of his kingdom work in the world through those follower learners. I like to think today in terms of Christ honoring Christianity, hope and fruitfulness. John chapter 15 and verse number one, John 15, one, we read a very familiar verse. It's another of those I am's that John records for us. John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. I can be worded, I am the vine, the true. And my father is the husbandman. Well, this would be very familiar imagery in the nature, in the, in the natural setting of the culture in which Jesus is speaking. This would also be a historic national imagery that the Jews would understand and be very familiar with. Israel was the vine of God, God's people in their covenant relationship with Jehovah. This vital connectedness of covenant relationship. In fact, at the temple, there was a golden vine, which reminded them that they were the vine. But see, Israel had violated the covenant. They had failed. How so? It's interesting to think about the parallels and the failure of Israel and the failure of Christ's church at times. Because Israel had a historic attraction to the gods of the surrounding nations. So they forgot to be, they forgot that their responsibility was being trusted as the faithful people of God. They lost track of that mission among the nations. They were blessed so that they might be a blessing. They were God's people that they might be a blessing to other nations, but they got, they settled in. They settled in. They failed. They even in a few hours from our text in John 15 crucified their very Messiah. Let me turn you back to Isaiah chapter 5 for just a moment. I think the setting will help us. Isaiah chapter 5, I'm only going to read seven verses. But what these seven verses will do is establish the context that a Jew would think about when he heard these words from the lips of Jesus, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Notice it with me as I read. This is Isaiah 5 and verse number 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, nor digged, and there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. For he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Israel failed the Lord as his vineyard. This was a historic reality that would come to mind for any Jew who heard Jesus say what he said. It would remind them of a people that was God's covenant people. And so when he says here in the context of these 11 disciples, which in extension would be the church, I am the true vine. 
That's a Jehovah claim. I am true. I am genuine. I am the vine in person. I am the vine, the true. I am the fulfilled reality that was foreshadowed through Jehovah's relationship with Israel. And he says, secondly, in John 15, 1, my father's the husbandman. That's the word for vine dresser. So there's a united spiritual work taking place, which doesn't surprise us because Jesus has continually spoken of his union with the Father and what he's doing in his mission. And he says it here, I, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, I'm the vine, the true, the genuine, the fulfilled reality that's foreshadowed through Israel and God, Jehovah, and the Father, he's the vine dresser. The saving mission of God continues through Jesus Christ and his church. The covenant promises of God continue and are advancing through Christ and his church. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Verse number two of John 15, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Secondly, any every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Very possible that as Jesus spoke these words, you could look around the area of Jerusalem, outlaying area, and see fires where they were burning. What had been pruned off of the vine. Every spring and every winter, they prune away at these vines. They would prune them rather severely so that they would bear fruit in the next season. A dead branch was cut off completely, cast into the fire. Ones that bore fruit were pruned so they could bear more fruit. Here we have a picture of what happened with Judas. Judas would be that branch that was dead, that was superficially attached. And Jesus says the Father cut that off, threw it in the fire. It's of no use. If a branch in a vine doesn't bear fruit, it has no other use other than to be used for the fire. But those that are bearing fruit, which would include the other, he prunes them. He gets them ready. He removes what we call the dead wood or the suckers that would suck up the, the sap, that suck up the strength. Verse number three, he continues, Now ye, speak unto the eleven that are left, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now immediately our minds are cast back to John 13, when Jesus washes their feet and raises the question, do you know what I just did? Peter reacts. Jesus explains to him, Peter, if I don't wash you, you don't have participation with me. There's a, a cleansing that is necessary. Peter responds again, well, wash me completely. Jesus says to Peter, you know, Peter, somebody that's been fully bathed doesn't need to be bathed again. They just need their feet washed where they pick up the defilement of this world. All of this was a picture of the cleansing work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All this was a testimony of how these disciples were supposed to relate to each other. Part of loving one another is this mutual foot washing, we might say, or this, this cleansing, this keeping accounts clean, keeping relationships open. Now Jesus says in verse 3 of John 15, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You have been cleansed, forgiven, purified, washed clean. You have been cleaned and cleansed through the word. This remission of sins that John introduces, John the Baptist introduces, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now Jesus is celebrating that last Passover with his disciples. And he says, you've been clean, and you were clean through my word. Christ honoring Christianity, hope and fruitfulness. Well, first of all, we see here that true believers experience a vital connection to God. True believers experience a vital connection to God. All true Christians are in the vine. They're in union with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And all genuine disciples are pruned by the Father himself. The Father does the vine dressing. The Father does the pruning. See, through Jesus, spiritual life flows to us. He says, I'm the vine, the true. He's the 
bread of life. He's the living water. He's the source of spiritual birth. He's the resurrection life. And the life of the vine flows into and out of believing people. Christ's life is granted to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We see that woven into the tapestry of Jesus' final instruction. Christ's life produces fruit in us and produces fruit through us. This flow of spiritual life sustains us and strengthens us. So true believers experience a vital connection to God. Through Jesus, spiritual life flows to us. I am the true vine. Secondly, through the Father, spiritual hindrances are removed from us. This ongoing transformative process of producing Christ in us through his word and through his spirit involves the Father cutting away the dead wood, the cleansing of all dead wood that drain the life out of us, that drain the spiritual energy from us, bring us forward in love and ministry toward God and others, that bring us forward in faith and obedience regarding the truth. One of the secrets to the Father's mission for us involves this ongoing pruning process. It's something that we naturally resist, but something that we understand from the scriptures is a necessary part of producing glory in God's people. The suffering, the hardship is that which brings forth the glory. True believers experience a vital connection to God. Through Jesus, spiritual life flows to us. He's the vine. Through the Father, spiritual hindrances are removed from us. He's the husbandman. Thirdly, we're going to see this in the coming verses, through the Spirit, spiritual fruit is produced in us. We learned some things about the Holy Spirit back in chapter 14. In our next message, we're going to take up this topic of the Holy Spirit and think this out a little further. But when you and I are thinking about Christ's likeness and conformity to Christ, fruitfulness, the fruit of the Spirit, that is produced by the Holy Spirit. It's produced by the Spirit of God in us, as we learned in Romans 8 on Wednesday night. It's produced by the Spirit of Christ in us, also in Romans chapter number 8. So there's, first of all, that spiritual fruit of Christ's likeness or conformity to Christ. But secondly, there is that spiritual fruit of Christ's mission. We're talking about the Great Commission. Multiplying disciples. These things go hand in hand. And we suffer when these aren't kept together. The Holy Spirit of God is producing spiritual fruit in us, but there's also the spiritual fruitfulness of making disciples of every nation. True believers experience a vital connection to God, and that involves the Trinity, the Son. Through Jesus the Son, spiritual life flows to us. Through the Father, Spiritual hindrances are removed from us, and through the Spirit, spiritual fruit is produced in us. In summary, we're talking about hope and fruitfulness as Christ honoring Christianity. Our hope is sustained only as we are involved in the eternal mission. What is the eternal mission? The eternal mission, according to Ephesians and according to Romans and according to Titus, is that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. But the eternal mission as well, according to those same texts, as well as according to the gospel record and the book of Acts, is the advancement of disciples, multiplying disciples, making disciples of nation. Our hope is sustained only as we are involved in the eternal mission. It involves love. It involves faith. It involves hope. It involves service. It involves obedience. It involves fruitfulness. Historically, Israel had completely lost sight, sight of her mission. They longed for the world with all of its offerings that had distracted her. They lost perspective regarding the place of blessing. And she was a defeated people. Israel was guilty of a superficial satisfaction with a moral existence. It dominated her days and her years. It dominated her history. These are the things that Jesus exposed. 
Jesus exposed these things, and Jesus' Messiahship declared hope to his own, as well as hope to the world. And now Jesus turns to his disciples and says, this is your mission. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. As Jesus continues in John 15, he calls his disciples to action. Made some statements in the first three verses. Help us understand who we are and where we are in our relationship with God, this vital connection. But notice now in verse number four, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And then he goes on in verse 5 to says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Speaking to these eleven, speaking now to us, he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. And a reminder here, for without me, ye can do nothing. But he's taken up this abide theme, so let's follow it out. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. You're true believers, you're true follower learners of Christ when you are bearing much fruit. So secondly, not only do we see that true believers experience a vital connection to God, but secondly, true believers are expected to maintain, to maintain active trust in God. This idea of abiding or remaining is that of a firm bond of union, an ongoing communion with Christ. Paul pictures it in terms of the head and the body. He's the head and the church is his body. Paul also speaks of it in terms of living stones in a building that the Holy Spirit is occupying and building the foundation stone of which is Jesus Christ. Paul also uses the imagery of a bride and the bridegroom, Christ being the bridegroom and the church being the bride, a settled attachment, a maintained connection. True believers are expected to maintain active trust in God. No one produces fruit who is detached from Christ. Spiritual fruit in Galatians chapter 5 is produced by the Holy Spirit living in us. The spiritual fruitfulness of Matthew 28, making disciples, is a testimony of our union with Christ, our attachment, vital attachment to God through Jesus Christ, and then in that indwelling Holy Spirit working in us and through us. To be separated from Christ is to bear no fruit, no genuine fruit. There might be some false fruit without substance, but to be joined with Christ is to have fruit produced in us, is to have Christ's likeness produced in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. False professions are men like Judas, exposed excused, dismissed. How is it that those false professors are exposed? Well, in another place, Jesus speaks of the soils. The three of those soils are not genuine. And he talks in terms of testings and the cares of this world will prove superficial attachments. Uh, they'll prove they have no root. It'll prove they have embrace something intellectually, but not given their soul to it. It might prove that they have been caught up in the emotion of it and yet have not genuinely been converted. No one produces fruit detached from Christ, verse 4 tells us. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. What about verse 5? I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me turns it the other way. And I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. 
So we see as well that all will produce fruit who abide in Christ. All will produce fruit who abide in Christ. To remain in Christ is to believe and obey Christ. To abide in Christ, remain in Christ is to love and serve Christ. To remain in Christ is to receive the inflow of his grace. And we will bear much fruit. Life will produce fruit. True fruit that remains. Evident life without distractions and rivals. Good works in Christ's likeness. Communion and even answered prayer. Look at it in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. The giving of ourselves, participation in the blessings. True believers are expected to maintain active trust in God. Dependency. Dependency. Without me, you can do nothing. Dependency. Recognized and exercised. Closeness. Cultivated and nurtured. Drawing close to God. Communion. Cherished. Delighting in the Lord. Communion cherished and maintained. Submission and obedience as a lifestyle. Dependency, closeness, communion, submission, obedience. Love and service, faith and obedience. Those are tangible expressions of faith. And then there's hope and fruitfulness. This is, this is Christ honoring Christianity. Our hope. Our hope is put on display only as we choose a personal pursuit of Christ. Our hope is put on display only as we choose a personal pursuit of Christ. This personal oneness through intimate communion, this missional oneness. Think about that. The personal oneness producing the fruit of the Spirit. But this missional oneness as we produce other as we multiply disciples through the inflow of his life into our life. The testimony of all four Gospels, as well as Acts 1-8, is that we have a mission. And in John's Gospel, Jesus tells them, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Matthew, he says, go and make disciples. That's what you're to do. That's the mission. Make disciples as you are going, as you are baptizing, as you are teaching. Here's the action word, make disciples. And then he promises his abiding presence. That's Matthew. In Mark's gospel, he says, go preach the gospel. Tell them to believe and be baptized. And when they are, they will be saved. If they don't believe, they'll be damned. Mark's emphasis is that they must respond to Christ, and our response to Christ is crucial. In Luke chapter 24, we have the commission given to us again. It's a testimony that Christ suffered and rose from the dead. It calls for repentance and remission of sins and says that must be preached among the nations. Start at, start at Jerusalem, Jesus says in Luke's gospel. And then Jesus tells them, ye are witnesses of these things. You, you men, you 11 men that have walked with me, listened to me, learned from me, you're witnesses of these things. In John chapter 20, we read that great commission again. It says, whoever sins ye remit will be remitted, and whoever sins ye retain will be retained. He doesn't put in the hands of the disciples they didn't put them in the place of granting forgiveness, but he puts them in the place of declaring forgiveness, telling people that when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, we have the fifth record of the Great Commission. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Samaria, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. There's an outline of the book of Acts. The first seven chapters are the witness of the disciples in Jerusalem and Judea. Chapter 8 is a testimony of their witness in Samaria. 
and chapters 9 through 28 are a testimony of their witness to the uttermost parts of the earth. So when we're talking about hope and fruitfulness, we're talking about where our hope rests. We're talking about being in the vine. We're talking about the production of the fruit of the Spirit, as well as the fruitfulness of being participants in the mission of Christ. As the Father has sent him, so he sends us. Our hope is put on display only as we choose a personal pursuit of Christ. Now, verse number nine, Jesus continues and he says, as the father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So he circles back and picks up that thread of love again, doesn't he? This is part of what it means to remain and abide in Christ. Remaining is the same as continuing in his love. It's a testimony of relationship and communion and participation. As the Father did love me, I too did love you. Now remain in my love, he says. True believers are edified. Edified as they respond and receive from divine love. True believers experience a vital connection to God. True believers are expected to maintain active trust in God. But thirdly, true believers are edified. They're built up as they respond to and receive from divine love, that same love and faith and hope that Christ has toward his Father is ours. And that same service and obedience and fruitfulness that Christ evidenced is ours. This is how the Christ life is lived out. We must take time to consider this and appreciate this and respond to this if we would enjoy everything the Lord has for us. Verse number 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Obedience. Obedience will be our way of life. To keep my commandments in verse number 10 is the idea of guarding them and cherishing them and regarding them with obedience. It has to do with doing the Father's will just like Jesus did. But he goes on in verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Joy will be our strength and testimony. John says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 3 that God's commandments are not grievous and burdensome to the believer. You'll find joy, he says, You'll find joy if these things remain in you. What things? Well, the things he just said for 10 verses, but also the things that he said before that in the previous chapter. You'll find joy in these as I have found joy in these. Jesus found joy in serving others. He found joy in loving others. He found joy in washing the disciples' feet and doing the Father's will. And he says, my joy will continue in you. You'll find the satisfaction and the contentment and the fulfillment and the purpose that you see in me. True believers are edified. They're built up as they respond to and receive from divine love. Obedience will be our way of life. Joy will be our strength and testimony. Thirdly, love. Love will be our observable fruit. He continues in verse number 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love, verse 13, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then drop down to verse number 17. At the end of this particular paragraph, he says again, these things I command you that ye love one another. Love will be our observable fruit. Jesus says, keep on loving each other. Keep on loving each other with that sacrificial self-giving love that you see in me. And they're about to see it demonstrated on the cross of Calvary. 
keep loving each other with the sacrificial self-giving love that you see in me. Keep living out this relational oneness that we enjoy through the Holy Spirit. They've been taught. They've been sustained. They've been guided by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says, you're going to be taught and sustained and guided and reassured by the ministry of the Spirit. He's going to develop that in chapter 14. Love will be our observable fruit. Verses 14 and 15, we see that communion will be our abiding experience. Building us up as we respond and receive from the divine love. Communion will be our abiding experience. Look at it in verses 14 and 15. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. He's not saying we are not occupied as bond slaves. He's saying, I'm not calling you that, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But he's even now telling them and explaining to them, and the Holy Spirit's going to come and teach them more. But I've called you friends, Jesus says in the middle of verse 15, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. Communion will be our abiding experience. When you think of a friend, you think of a love relationship. You think of affection, you think of communication, you think of intimacy. You think of union and communion, not just serving, although service continues, but living in this relationship where Jesus has displayed his heart, where Jesus has communicated his heart to these men. He's opened up his soul to them. Obedience will be our way of life. This is Christ honoring Christianity. Hope and fruitfulness, obedience will be our way of life. Joy will be our strength and testimony. Love will be our observable fruit. And communion will be our abiding experience. We have one more verse. Look at verse number 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Look at the next phrase, the last statement of verse 16, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So lastly, we notice that expectancy, expectancy, we're back to that issue of hope, aren't we? Expectancy will be our sustaining portion. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name. That has to do with living in such union and communion with Jesus Christ, being such a friend of Christ that the things that we ask will be the things that he actually wants done. Our will will be blended into his will so much so that when we pray, we pray in accordance with his will. And when we pray in accordance with his will, the Father promises to answer those prayers. When we pray in accordance with the will of the Father and the Son, we are promised that He will hear us and He will answer in accord with His will, His promises, and His purposes. See, our hope is enjoyed and communicated to others through these daily triumphs of grace. When they Look into your life and see obedience being a way of life. When they watch you and they see joy as your strength and testimony, as they see love as that observable fruit, they will know that you are disciples of Christ. As they see that communion as an abiding experience that you walk and talk in a relationship with Jesus Christ, when they see that expectancy is your sustaining portion, they will be ministered to. They will see Christ. They will see Christ honoring Christianity. And we will enjoy our hope. Our hope is enjoyed and communicated to others through daily triumphs of grace. These things are glorious truths that Jesus Christ taught his disciples. They're straightforward. There are things that we can see each time we come to a portion like this, and we can meditate on these things and begin to set these things up beside our life, and we need to look back and say, so how 
How has that love been demonstrated this week? We're put to the test. Sometimes what comes out of us is not love for Christ and love for others. How has that been evidenced? How about this joy? How about this abiding joy that was the joy of Jesus Christ that just found great satisfaction and contentment and fulfillment in walking hand in hand with the Father and his purposes? What about this obedience as a way of life? A predisposition of faith that says, you know, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. An unwillingness to, to alter the standard. What about this communion as our abiding experience? We're walking in relationship with the Lord in such a way that the testings come and there's triumphs of grace. The answers to our asking God to take away the thorn are no, and we say, he said no, but he taught me that his grace was sufficient for me. What about this expectancy? What about this living in light of the promised return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise that he is preparing a place for us, a permanent dwelling place in the Father's house? Did you live this week as one who had a permanent dwelling place in the Father's house? Did you respond to the circumstances and situations of this week in such a way that gave testimony that you knew without a question were secured in and assured of a permanent dwelling place in the Father's house. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you for these three weeks where we've been able to step aside a little bit and try to pick up some of these threads that John records woven together by the Lord Jesus Christ in those final hours of ministry. We believe these to be essential. We believe these to be things that John circles back to because he's trying to drive them home to our hearts. He's trying to help us see how these are woven into our own lives. And if we're going to be testimonies of Christ, if we're going to be one, uh, that tapestry that portrays Christ before others, we need to understand and embrace by faith the reality of these things. Help us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.